I've been preaching a series entitled, Behold and Honor. I started this series by talking about how God has beheld us, and he has ascribed honor to us. Let me describe or decipher or distinguish those two words. The word behold in the English, g'day Ernest, good to see you, Annika, God bless you. Uh, the word behold in English means more than to see. It means to see deeply. To behold literally means to decipher, to decode, to understand, to look beyond the surface. You see, we all have crazy moments. Who here has never had a crazy moment? Because that'll be your first crazy moment to put your hand up in a public <laughs> arena and say you've never had a crazy moment. <laughs> and you might just witness a lot of people getting crazy. Yeah. We've all had crazy moments. The phenomenal thing is that God looks past the broken us. God looks past the messed up us. God looks past the wounded us. And he sees the journey that got us there. And he loves us. Most people see the crazy us and decide that's too crazy. I can't be a part of that. But God in his amazing love beholds us. He looks past the surface of what's fractured. And he sees the journey and he understands us. He decodes us. He deciphers us. And he loves us. And for someone to do that, that is just absolutely amazing and incredible. Most people will not. But then God takes it another mile further, and he assigns honor. In the Bible, in the Greek, the word to honor your parents means assign value. In this world, sometimes, not all the time, we give honor if honor is due. Sometimes honor is due and we still don't give honor. We are a society that is by and large honorless. We have learned to live without giving honor. But we have a saying that we don't live up to, give honor where honor is due. In the kingdom of God, God gives honor even when honor isn't due. Because when God puts the anointing of honor on us, it's because he beholds us and sees past our brokenness and sees the destiny that he intended for us. And so he treats us with honor. Honor is an anointing. And when you put honor on a person, they will grow into the value you have assigned to them. That's what God does with us. Last week, very quickly, I started this message, Behold and Honor Yourself. I just identified the meaning of behold and the meaning of to honor. Look past your own mistakes. Look past your past. Look past the failure of maybe an hour ago and decipher, decode who you really are. I make mistakes, but it doesn't change the fact that I am a new creation. I make bad decisions at times. It doesn't change the fact that the fullness of God is in Jesus and the fullness of Jesus is in me. That's Bible. That's Scripture. I may not always live up to my potential. It doesn't mean that seed of potential isn't in me. Hello? Absolutely. And uh, we learned this Principle last week, principle number one, and that is that everything that God created, whether it was birds or whether it was a, a, a humpback whale or whether it was monkeys or giraffes or uh, it was a lion or it was a fruit tree or a flower, God gave every living thing a seed, and in that seed, he wrote the destiny of their design. And the principle is this. 
God says in Genesis chapter 1, over and over again, as he creates each thing, he says, and they will reproduce after their kind. That's the principle we found last week. Every living thing, put it on the screen, every living thing reproduces after its kind, and the seed holds the destiny of God's chosen design or DNA for that living thing. Can we put that on the screen? Have you got it? There you go. That's the principle we learned last week. Every living thing reproduces after its kind. God said it. That's a divine law. And the seed holds the destiny of God's chosen design for that thing. It holds the DNA for that living thing. It cannot reproduce anything but what it is. When God created man, he created man not after his kind. He changes the language and he says, I will make man in our image. We will make man in our image. And the Hebrew word is teslaim. And it means to be a shadow of to be a phantom of, you are similar, but you are not God. So God created man, unlike the animal world and the plant world, to actually bear his resemblance. God took his character and put it inside a man. God did not take his deity and put it inside a man. But he took his character. He took his potential. The Bible says that God crowned man with glory and honor. He created them in a higher status. And the Bible says that everything his hands created were under the authority and the governorship of Adam and Eve. He put his God likeness in them. God says, let's create man in our image, Teslem, and in our likeness, and that word is demuth. And demuth means similitude. So God created man to be a phantom of himself, a shadow of who he is, a representative figure on the earth. And when God created man in his likeness, he then gave man seed to reproduce after his kind. When the demonic world saw that the world would be populated with sons of God, with incredible human beings, with a godlike nature, character, supernatural abilities. Satan said, oh my God, what's going to happen if the earth is filled with more representations of God himself? And Satan looked at himself and the fallen angels. See, the Bible says that Lucifer fell. You have to understand this biblical term. It's a concept. It's not just a phrase. A fallen being falls from the high state of the glory and the destiny that God had intended for it, and it loses its status. It loses that glory. It loses that destiny, and it becomes a fraction of what it once was meant to be. And not only is it a fraction of what it was once meant to be, it is a distorted fraction. So a fallen angel doesn't come close to a non-fallen angel. When you fall, you're not just in the bad books, you fall from the status of the destiny of God's design. Are you hearing me? I don't know why the church gets so afraid of demons. You have authority in Jesus' name. You have power through the Holy Ghost. You are called to be sons of God. And now that you are born again, you are seated in, at the right hand of the Father in the same seat as Jesus Christ. He's the head, you're the body. If you ever have a head in a different seat than the body, you got a problem. God understands the English language. He said, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Everything's under his feet. He is the head, the church is the body. 
And then all of those fallen demons are under our feet. So Satan looks and he says, okay, we know what it is to be fallen. We are far less than what God originally intended. We know the glory we had. We didn't just lose favor. We lost the glory and the honor of God. If man is going to reproduce after his seed and he was created in the teslem, the image, and the demuth, the likeness of God, that's going to be a major headache for us. Can we get man to fall so that they become less than their destiny? Can we get man to fall So he loses the glory and the honor, the God nature and character around him so that he'll be a fallen creature just like us. That's what the Garden of Eden was all about. A strategy, a ploy to gain mastership over the earth and over these God-like representations of the creator. And so he gets Adam and Eve to fall and they become less than. Instead of having being partakers of the divine nature, they now became partakers of a sin nature. They are fallen. And the first thing Adam and Eve noticed was that they were naked. You want to tell me that all this time they didn't know they were naked? They didn't see each other. You gotta be careful how I say this. <laughs> they didn't see each other with all their glory hanging out. <laughs> when the Bible says they noticed they were naked, what it really means is they noticed that the image and the character and the likeness of God was no longer clothing. They had fallen. They are less than what their destiny was meant to be. And Lucifer made sure he got Adam and Eve to fall from their destiny before they reproduced even one child. Because you can only reproduce after your kind. And so the first Adam became the fallen Adam, and he has reproduced after his kind. And every one of us are fallen. So God sends the last Adam, and because it is principle, every living thing will be given seed, and in that seed is the power of the destiny and the design, and they will reproduce after their kind. He sends the last Adam, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior to save us from the fall. The church thinks only in terms of my sins are forgiven, I'm going to heaven. The gospel of the kingdom says no, it's more than that. You're being reinstated to your former glory. Not just a position. There's a transformation, a miraculous change on the inside. Look at me. If the first Adam fell, and as a human being had the power to reproduce fallen sons and daughters, do you think the last Adam who came from heaven can at least match that power and have the power to give birth to sons who are in his image? You see, in our religious thinking, we don't realize we preach a gospel that actually slaps God in the face and says that the first Adam has more power to influence humanity than the last Adam. We've reduced the gospel to the erasing of our sins. No, God erases the failed nature and reinstates us to our destiny and our glory. There is more God in you than you realize. Not because you're God, you will never be God. He's God. But he has put his divine nature and his character in you. 
Peter says that in 2 Peter. If you've been with me the last few weeks, you've heard me quote that scripture. We are partakers of the divine nature. Peter says we're born again, not of a corruptible seed, but of an incorruptible seed. When are we going to stop saying this stuff in a sing-song religious way and just tantalize the tips of our nerve endings in our brain? When are we going to stop just like a bunch of dinglings, just quoting it religiously and allow it to go deep into our soul and say there is more stuff to this Jesus saving us. We are born again. Behold the oldest past. We really are a new creation. So according to the first principle we learned last week, Every living thing has in its seed to reproduce after its kind. Jesus said, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, the tree that is in that seed can never come to life. So Jesus becomes the seed of the last Adam. He dies so that he can allow many seeds to be germinated and that sons of God will fill the earth. Can I get an amen? The first Adam reproduced after his kind. The last Adam reproduced after his kind. And there's more God potential in me than I understand. The reasons for me to succeed far outnumber the reasons for me to fail. Yeah, God is good. God des destined that man would reproduce after the design that God put in his DNA. Man would reproduce after his kind. Fallen Adam reproduced after his kind. The last Adam reproduced after his kind. I was in Uruguay years ago, probably... 20, 15, 20 years ago, The Incredibles, the cartoon, had just come out. I was preaching in an open-air setting to a youth, a national youth conference. And I was preaching about who we are in Christ. And I had my shirt on like this here. But underneath, I had a T-shirt. It was my Mr. Incredibles T-shirt. And I ripped it off in the arena in front of all those young people. I said, there's something bigger and greater inside of all of us. Pastor Daniel was there. He's sitting up the front now. After the meeting, he came up to me. He said, I want that T-shirt. So I gave him my smelly T-shirt. He's been wearing it ever since. <laughs> Principle number two. Here's today's sermon. We played catch up. Principle number two. I'm going to read to you a scripture that we don't read often. But I'm going to pull out a principle that is quite obscure in that verse that we don't read often. And I'm going to preach about that principle. Are you ready? Yes. This is principle number two. Principle number one tells me if everything has to reproduce after its kind, I am born again into the kind of Jesus Christ. It helps me to behold myself and look past the mistakes I made an hour ago and say, there's more in you. You can act less than your potential, but when you act less than your potential, it doesn't define your potential, nor does it limit your potential. We can live up to our potential. Wow. Husbands, Ephesians 5, 25 to 26. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. I am convinced that in the second service, they take half an hour off the clock. I rebuke that thing in Jesus' name. You lying, filthy devil. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. This is what Christ has done. 
He gave himself up for the church to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. Do you know that Jesus washes us with water through the word? There's a very novel thing. It's called a shower. Has anyone ever had one? Thank God we have. <clears throat> Otherwise, I would reinstitute that we all wear masks if no one had a shower. Gas masks. We shower and we wash away the grime. We wash away the dirt. We wash away the sweat. We wash away the stuff that makes us feel less than. You know what an amazing coincidence is for everybody? That after we have a shower, we feel fresh. Yes. Jesus cleanses his church by the washing of water through the word. And what's interesting is that word, the word, in this one instance, is not logos. See, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that was created was created without Him, the Word. And the Word became flesh and dwelled amongst men. And He became the light of the world. That Word, the Word, is logos. If you want to go deep for a second, there's a word that precedes logos, and it's lego. Lego is a discussion. Uh, it is the desires and the plans of somebody's heart laid out on the table. Lego in the Greek. Jesus is the logos. He picked up the, the heart the plan, the desires of God that were laid out on the table, the Lego, and he became the expression of God's Lego. He is the Logos. He becomes the revelation of the will of God. And so in creation, Jesus stood on the edge of the universe and everything that the Father had put on the table, the Son stands on the edge of the universe. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and nothing that was created was created with it, without Him. And Jesus becomes the Logos of the Lego, and He starts speaking out everything that was in God's heart. And He says, let there be light! And the Spirit of God that was hovering on the face of the earth starts to move. You know why? It's the Spirit of God. When the heart of God is spoken through the Son, the Logos, the Spirit of the Word that was on the table fills the spoken Word and creates it. Jesus is the Logos. And most times when the Bible is referred to as the Word or the Word is mentioned in the New Testament, most times it's the Logos. But here, Paul says, Jesus cleanses the church with water through the Word, but this time it's a different word. It's Rima. Rima. Can we put it on the screen? Rima. The word Rima comes from the word Rio. Rio means to speak. The word Rima literally is used in the New Testament anytime that the Lord is speaking and his living word in a believer to birth faith in them. Here. When the Logos becomes a revelation to you, how many of you have ever read the Logos, the Word of God, and suddenly you have a, a aha moment, and the lights go on? Who said aha? Thank you. You've had a few of them, right? You read the Logos. Jesus said, my word is spirit and life. He didn't say my words are spiritual. This is the difference between the Word of God and all the compilations of the wise words of so-called spiritual men and women. 
The word of God is alive. The same breath that God exhaled when he first said the word, it is full of spirit, and every time you read the word, that same spirit of that word is present. And when you read the word and you have this aha moment, what happens is it goes from logos to rima. It becomes the revelation inside of you and the lights go on and some, suddenly somebody's at home inside your head. Whoa! You see the word and it comes alive. And Paul says Jesus cleanses the church by the washing of water. How many of you have ever come to church and felt like you had a shower? Only a couple. Jeez, I'm not doing as good as I thought I was. How many of you have ever come to church and felt like you had a shower? You felt refreshed. The word of God just washed over you. How many of you are having one of those right now? You see, when I talked about the sun standing on the edge of the universe, I heard, whoa, I heard, ah, you were having remas. God washes the church with water through the rima. In other words, every time you get an aha moment, the word of God is speaking to you and it's washing off the old you and the old mindsets of you and he's bringing the new you. A rima is the word of God spoken to you by the Holy Spirit that becomes a revelation to you, it's alive in you. So Paul is saying we need, I don't know why I did that. Paul is saying we need to wash ourselves off from every thought that disagrees with God's thoughts and wash ourselves with the rima of God's word. I'm running out of time. Pastor Daniel, would you come here? You see, the devil has a word too. Remus will bring you life. The word of God is spirit and life. The word of the devil is spirit and death. It'll leave a spiritual residue on you. And so the devil comes along and he speaks into your ear. He speaks into your emotions and he starts writing. Reject. And we believe we're a reject. I'm, a, I'm no good. God doesn't love me. I didn't perform well yesterday. I sinned. I fell. I made a mistake. I was less than. And we're so used to conditional love. We're so used to human love being put in a form and in a format that if you do good, I'll be happy with you. And so we stumble, and devils make sure they help us stumble because they know we're locked into a human sense of conditional love. And once that human sense of conditional love kicks in, we start reasoning with ourselves, God can't love me. Heck, if he loved me when I was a sinner, if he loved me when I wasn't looking for him, if he died on the cross while I was cursing him out and doing sinful things, how much more he loves me now that I'm a son and occasionally I make a mistake. And so we need Remus, the revelation of God's word, to get into us and we need to wash ourselves with the washing of the water of the Word of God. And so I take promises that tell me that I am the beloved of the Lord. And I say, devil, you're a liar. I may have sinned. I may have made a mistake. 
but the blood of Jesus washes me clean and I am a new creation. I am a son of God. He lives me. He loves me. He has a purpose for me. There is destiny in me. I am washed by the blood of Jesus. The washing with water of the Rima. You got to get into the Word of God because if you only read it casually, it'll be the Logos. But when you read it and read it and read it and you allow your emotions to be excited, it goes from being Logos to Rima. And when it's Rima, it'll change you. Let's put his hair back. Hang on, it needs a little bit more work. There you go. Now it sticks. Devil comes along and says, You're nothing but a failure. How many of you have ever had this written on your head? Failure. And you know, the sad thing is that we don't remember principle one. You see, when you eat a mango, you throw away the seed. Seed doesn't taste good. You throw away the seed because it's got this dry, fibrous section and it's not palatable. It gets stuck in your teeth. Who wants to eat a mango seed? But we don't behold the seed. If we behold the seed, we look at the seed on the surface. If we behold the seed, we say inside that seed is a tree. That seed that we throw away, you all throw them away. We all throw them away. I don't. Russ and Danielle have been giving me seeds from their mom's tree. I want you to know I'm drying them out. This is a tree inside every one of those seeds. And in that tree is a thousand mangoes. So one seed has a tree that'll have a thousand mangoes. It will reproduce after its kind because of principle number one. That seed has a mango tree that has a thousand mangoes in it. All that potential's in that seed. I could throw it in the bin. It'll go to the dump. Or I can cultivate it. And if it has one tree that has a thousand mangoes, then each of those thousand mangoes have a thousand trees. Each mango has a tree which equals a thousand trees. And a thousand trees times one thousand fruit per tree. I now have a mango forest that can feed a whole tribe in Africa. But we look at life on the surface and we don't behold and decipher and decode. So the devil says you're a failure, but we fail to recognize principle number one. Every seed must reproduce after its kind. Jesus was made in the image, the teslam, the demuth of the father. He is the icon, mirror-like representation of the father he must reproduce after his kind devil says i'm a failure i said and we believe it god says no christ in you the hope of glory this is who you really are but we don't behold we look and we hear and we take what the devil says on the surface and the devil points to the fact that an hour ago you screwed up and you say, yeah, that defines me. That's who I am. That doesn't define me. My mistakes don't define me. A moment of weakness doesn't define me. The blood of Jesus Christ defines me. I'm not who the devil says I am. I am, and I believe I am, who God says I am. And so when that logos becomes a revelation, you take that revelation, and it is a rima, and you say, no, 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 no. I'm not a failure. 
I am a son of God, and I have purpose, and I have destiny, and I have the Christ, the, the, the glory of Christ in me, the hope of glory. I am not born again of a corruptible seed. I am born again of an incorruptible seed. That's what's in me. Oh, wow. Did I happen to say that a seed has a tree in it? Yes. And that every tree produces a thousand fruit? Yes. And therefore every fruit has a seed and that's a thousand trees? Yes. Can you see the seed is growing? <laughs> Look at the forest. <laughs> Cut me open, I could feed half of Africa. <laughs> Listen to me. The washing with water by the rima of God's word. You and I need to do this on a regular basis. On a regular basis. Put your hands together for Pastor Daniel. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1 verse 31 says that through his great and precious promises, verse 4, you may participate in the divine nature through his great and precious promises. You've got to read this stuff. Man, I've been preaching it for weeks. Why? Because I can't get new material? Heck no! I've been preaching it because I want the logos to become a rima so that you don't just clap when I say Christ in you. You have been restored back to the image of the first Adam and you're never going to lose that position because the title holder is Jesus. Just like the title holder was the first Adam, the devil seduced him. He gave up the title. We were sunk. But the devil will never seduce Jesus Christ. He's the title holder. I might sin, but Jesus holds the title, not Rob Scarallo. So the moment I get up, I accept my forgiveness, I repent, I just step back into who I am in Jesus Christ. Yeah, put that on the mirror. You've got to know the word. You've got to know the promises of God and then let it become a rima and then start washing all the lies off. Start washing all the poo-poo that the devil says and start saying what God says. Here, I know I took a verse that isn't often quoted and I took an obscure principle from a verse that isn't often quoted, and I'm making a point. Now the question is, is Pastor Rob twisting the word of God just so that we could have a motivational moment and we could all leave grace and faith today happy and smiling, but he gave us a word that inspired us but not really theologically sound. Well, I don't think you're thinking that, but I'm gonna challenge that thought anyway because I believe that the word of God goes deep and it proves itself over and over again. Can I get an agreement here? It was a young man. He was gonna follow in the footsteps of Moses. Moses in Hebrew. Culture, I mean, Moses, it's like, he's the big daddy. He wrote the Pentateuch. Moses brought us the law. Moses. Here's Joshua going to step into Moses' shoes. Moses, as great as he was, had three million Hebrews constantly fighting with him because they were born with a slave mentality. For 300 years, they were told they were slaves. They worked as slaves. They lived as slaves. Now, they're not slaves, but they're still thinking like slaves. And Moses is telling them, we're going to go into the promised land. Twelve spies get sent out. Two come back and say, yeah, we could do it. There's giants in the land. We could beat the snot out of them. They knew who they were. Ten came back and said, uh-uh. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. No. The problem was they were like grasshoppers in their sight. 
That was the problem. And so Moses goes on to be with God, and here's Joshua. Now it's his job to clear out the land and bring three million Hebrew slaves who were never trained in warfare. And he had to do what Moses didn't do. And God says to him in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Do not be afraid, be of good courage. In verse 8, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, don't let it depart from your mouth. Observe it according to everything that's written in it, and you will do. Let me tell you how that sounded in Hebrew. The word depart is the word mush. Everybody say mush. mush. The word depart, don't let the book of the law depart from your mouth. That doesn't mean don't let it come out of your mouth. What it means in Hebrew is don't let it be withdrawn from your mouth. Literally and figuratively, don't let God's word cease from coming out of your mouth. Don't let it depart as in it never gets spoken. Don't let it be removed. Don't let it be taken away. So here God is talking to Joshua who's so afraid because he's got to do what Moses didn't do in 40 years. They went around the mountain. Here they are again at the same starting point. And God says, Joshua, here's the key to success. If you do what I tell you, you will have great success. This law, this book, is a legal binding contract. I'm the only one making the offer. I am putting ties on myself. I am binding myself to this word. I want you to take my promises and don't let my promises stop from coming out of your mouth. I want you to keep speaking this legal document over and over again. Everybody understand? The second word is meditate. We understand meditation from an Eastern philosophy perspective, and it means to empty your th mind of any thought. In other words, be an airhead. In Hebrew culture, this is what the word meditate means. It is totally different. In Hebrew, the word meditate is daga, and it means to murmur, repeat quietly, moan, Growl, utter, speak, muse, talk. To, med to meditate is to give voice to God's word. To meditate in Hebrew, God is saying, hey Joshua, I made a legal binding contract. Everything I will do for you, these are my promises. Don't stop repeating them to yourself. In fact, I want you to double down. I want you to meditate. So not only moosh, don't let it stop from coming out of your mouth. Meditate on it. I want you to say it quietly. I want you to say it loudly. I want you to roar. You see, this is how you roar the word of God. If God be for me, who will ever be against me? Yeah. To meditate in the Hebrew language, God is saying, hey, Josh, I understand you're scared. Look at me, look at me, come on, look at me, Joshua. I want you to take this legal contract. It's binding on me. These are my promises. I don't want it to stop coming out of your mouth. Keep speaking it. Don't, don't put it away. Let it be on your lips constantly. Now, double down. Don't just let it be on your lips. I want you to whisper it. I want you to sing it. I want you to shout it. I want you to growl. How many of you remember, it was either last week or two weeks ago, I said, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he's in us. Give me a growl. Come on, everybody, give me a growl. 
Sometimes. <laughs> you scared me, Pastor Tom. <laughs> Sometimes we got to get ferocious with the Word of God. We got to growl. You got to let the rima of the logos be so real in you that you. Yeah. Yeah, see, the devil's I just scared. So to meditate literally means to whisper it to speak it, to growl it, to shout it, to talk, to murmur. The third word is do. I'm running out of time. To do. The word do doesn't mean, well, go ahead and try to perform. The word do in Hebrew is the word asa, and it means accomplish, advance, become, bear, bestow, bring forth. This is what God said to Joshua. Joshua, don't be afraid. Be of good courage. I'm with you. Now, take the promises I've said to you, and I don't want them to stop coming out of your mouth. Don't let anyone put you off. Keep letting my promises come out of your mouth. In fact, I want you to meditate on it. I want you to sing it in the shower. I want you to whisper it as you're going down to bed. During the day when giants are just... Uh, over the hill, I want you to growl like the lion of the tribe of Judah, and I want you to declare the promises that I've made. This is a covenant. I am making a legal binding contract with you. Keep speaking the word, because as you speak my promises, the spirit of my words will cause you to bear, it will cause you to bring forth, it will cause you to bestow stow everything I said, it will come out of you because you are declaring my word and my word is spirit and life. You see what God was telling Joshua was, Joshua, you need to wash yourself off from everything that says you guys are nothing but slaves. You need to get a Rima on my binding contract, which is a Logos, and you need to wash yourself in my promises. Wash yourself with that Rima, because my word isn't just spiritual, it is spirit. And the same spirit that was released from my mouth when I said the words 2,000 years earlier is the same spirit that will be present when you release my word as a rima. Twisting scripture, Pastor Rob. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the Lord is, there is liberty. Two weeks ago, I preached, and I said this word liberty in the Greek is the word eleutheros, and it means, properly, it means to be unbound, unshackled, free to realize one's destiny in Christ. The Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is the Spirit that sets you free. You will know the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The Spirit of the Lord is a liberating, delivering spirit. He will break shackles. He will break the bars of iron off of you. He will break the things that crippled you in your childhood. Listen to me. If we understand the promises of God, the Spirit of the Lord, as we quote Scripture over ourselves, will set us free from the prison. It'll set us free from the bondage. It'll set us free from the irons. It'll set us free from the handcuffs. It'll set us free from the ball and chains of everything that happened in our past. The Spirit of the Lord is the Spirit of liberty. He will unshackle you. He will deliver you. He will set you free. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Verse 18, but you and I, with unveiled faces, now that we got the revelation, are beholding as in a mirror 
the glory of the Lord. Mirror, glory of the Lord. We read a couple of weeks ago that Jesus is the exact image of the Father. And the word image is icon. And it says a mirror representation of the original. We are looking into the mirror who is Jesus. He is the mirror reflection of the Father, created in the Teslam, the image of God, created in the demuth of God, the similitude. He is the icon of the Father. He is the expression of everything that was in the Lego, the God's will, God's mind, God's de uh, desire for humanity, Jesus became the logos, the spoken expression of God's heart. He is the image. And as we behold the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is setting us free and we look into the mirror of Jesus Christ who is reflecting God the Father. And as we look into the mirror of Jesus Christ, the Spirit that sets us free is changing us from the Im one image to another image and we are increasing in the image of the Lord. When you take the logos of God and you speak it like a rima, and you look at the promises of God and you speak them over yourself, Christina, you are looking into the face of Jesus and you are saying everything you are is in me. And I believe it. Hallelujah. So no, this isn't a twist of theology just to give you a buzz. I'll, I've proved it to you from different angles to show you that I am not manipulating the word of God. This is theology. And God used this principle to raise up a young man to be one of the greatest generals ever in history. He didn't take three million fighting men. He took three million broken slave mentality people who were constantly grumbling that even God had to leave him in the desert for 40 years. And he cleared out a land with these people. Because he taught one man how to take the logos of God and wash his mind with the rima of the logos. Wow. Powerful stuff. These two principles, the principle I taught last week and the principle I'm teaching today, the washing of water with the word, the rima will enable you, if you understand the principle of last week, every seed must reproduce after its kind. Jesus came as the icon of the Father, a mirror-like representation. Oh, heck, hang on. The first Adam was created in the image, Teslem, the phantom-like shadow representation of God built in the likeness, the similitude of God. First Adam, last Adam. Wow. Wow. They both had this God stuff in them. And every seed must reproduce after its kind. I was born after the first Adam. No wonder I'm so broken. But now I'm born again after the last Adam. When we understand that principle, we can decode. We look in the mirror and we can behold ourselves and say, no, you're not the sum total of your poor decisions. You are the sum total of God's good decision. You are the sum total of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we start washing our face with the rima of what God says we are. And the Spirit of the Lord will literally start breaking the chains and breaking the shackles and transforming us into the image that we are beholding from glory to greater glory, Paul says. What's glory? The character of God. And he will take us from one level of interacting with God, God's character in us, and he will mature us until we keep growing in the character and image of God. Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Right here. 
Everything you've been religiously taught has the power to be the gravestone that stops the resurrection of the new man. But when we remove the gravestone and we let the word of God wash our brain, the obstacle is rolled away. And behold, the old is past. The new has come. The Greek says, you are a new species. Pretty awesome stuff. You're not just a sinner who's forgiven. You were a sinner. The grace of God has forgiven you. But the grace of God has bestowed an honor on you and on me that we have not earned. He has reinstated us to what the first Adam was supposed to be. He has made us who the last Adam is. You and I will never be God. Jesus is God. But there are God-like character traits in you. There is more strength in you than you realize. There is more God-like character traits in you than the devil wants you to realize. He knows that if you get this revelation, suddenly the church will be filled with phantom-like images and representations of God. And the church is still preaching a salvation that is purely about the forgiveness of your sins. And the church should be preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The kingdom has come back, and it's come back with the sons of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Stand with me. Every eye closed. Church doesn't change you. Religion doesn't change you. Unless you're a worker, please just, this is the most important moment. It's relationship that changes you. A relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have never asked Jesus Christ in your heart, you know you want to do that. You need to do that. That is the beginning of connecting with destiny. That's the beginning of letting God make things right in you. The awesome thing is God doesn't care how much we screwed up. He cares how much we want to ask for help. If you have never asked Jesus Christ into your heart, come on, raise your hand right now. All across this auditorium. Start to raise your hand if you've never done that and you want to ask Jesus in your heart. You want this God design to be inside of you. You want him to forgive you. You want Jesus to live in you. You want the chains to be broken. You want to be born again. Come on, put your hand up right now if that's you. God's talking to you. I, I know in my heart he's telling me there are several people here that he's tapping you on the shoulder. You're feeling the weight of his presence, but he wants you to feel the joy of his restoration. Every eye closed. If that's you, raise your hand. Say, I want to accept Jesus. I want him to be my Lord, my Savior. Come into my heart. Set me free. If you're watching online right now, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Everyone in the room, pray this prayer. Dear God, I believe you love me. This is amazing. You love me, even though I'm broken. Jesus Christ, I accept you as my Lord. Come into my life. Be my savior. Wash me. Your blood paid the price for my mistakes. Thank you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. 
But more than that, live in me. I receive you as my God and as my Savior. Thank you. Amen. Amen. To the rest of you, we're about to close this service. But I want to encourage you. The same way God beholds you, I want you to behold you. Look past the surface. Don't let yesterday's mistakes define you. Let the seed that is in you define you. Yeah, you were born of the first Adam, but you got a second chance. You went down the birth canal a second time. You asked Jesus in your heart. And the same way you bore the likeness of all of the first Adam's brokenness, you bear the likeness of the last Adam's God stuff. Everyone, look at me. Look at me. Come on, look at me. I want you to say this. There's more God stuff inside of me than I've discovered. And I can do more than I've ever given myself credit for. I am going to assign honor to myself. I'm going to put value on me. And I'm going to do that by believing what God's Word says about me. I am all that. I am all that. I am all that because of Jesus. Devil, you're a liar. Shut up and go back to hell. I wash myself with the water of God's word. God's word and chains are breaking, chains are breaking. Amen. Amen. Amen now turn around give at least six people